What's happening, model makers? It is a very sweltering hot afternoon in late June. And I am finally ready to do something that I've been working towards for almost a year now. And that is, as I told you about a week ago, uh, finally show you the finished results of my uh, 148th scale Accurate Miniatures B25B Mitchell project, which is finally, <laughs> finally done and photographed and ready for uh, a little video presentation. So, uh, over the next little bit here, um, here's what I'm going to do and what I'm not going to do. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to talk a whole lot about the kit because, uh, as you know, if you've kept up with this project, I've put in about 10 hours of video behind me already talking uh, ad nauseum about this kit. Um, I, I will say this. Uh, it is, this has been an adventure for a lot of reasons, but the unexpected reason was... <laughs> just in the nature of how people feel about this kit. Um, I've never seen anything so polarizing. Um, but we'll talk more about that later, uh, towards the end of the video. Um, it's, uh, it's definitely been interesting. What I am going to do is um, just kind of do a summary of, of what I've done uh, with the kit, just overall, maybe highlight some of the major issues, but not spend a whole lot of time on that. Um, because like I said, I, I've already pretty well beat that horse to, to death and uh, stomped it well into the dirt. <laughs> what I also want to do though is spend some time talking about the motivation for this uh, whole project, which was the Doolittle Raid and why I chose to model Doolittle's plane itself. So um, I'm going to spend some time talking about Doolittle, who I consider to be a true American hero. But, before we get to all that, um, let me show you some pictures. And uh, you guys can uh, see exactly what I've come up with. Um, now, fair warning, this is a pretty lengthy slideshow. I think there's like 30 or 32 photographs in it. And that's not because I think this is some sort of, of monument to model making and it should have all these pictures. <laughs> um, but look, I spent nearly a year building it. And it's a pretty large model. And uh, good or bad, right or wrong, I poured over every square millimeter of this thing. <laughs> so um, I want to show it to you. And I hope you don't mind suffering through a bunch of pictures um, uh, in that interest. Uh, so anyway, without any more uh, flapping of my gums, let's take a look. Travel so hard. Trouble so hard, don't nobody know my trouble but God. Don't nobody know my trouble but God. Ooh, Lord, in my trouble so hard. Ooh, Lord, in my trouble so hard. Don't nobody know my trouble but God. Don't nobody know my trouble but God.
trouble so hard. Don't nobody know my trouble but God. Don't nobody know my trouble but God. All right, so there you have it. That it, that's that's what I've managed to pull off. Now, as promised, uh, just in case you haven't uh, subjected yourself to all the hours of video that I've produced on this thing, and don't know kind of what the uh, kind of the basics are, let me give you a rundown of what all I've done uh, to this kit, and I'll, I'll just kind of start at the nose, I guess, and and work my way backwards. Uh, you're not going to be able to see it very well uh, from up there, but the uh, nose gear uh, is a scratch-built combination of brass, stainless steel, and the uh, fork end of the uh, Scale Aircraft Conversions white metal uh, landing gear. Um, as well discussed in the in previous chapters, the uh, nose gear that comes with the kit is just really weak plastic and not very well molded and since it was going to be sticking out of there the whole time I was working on it, uh, you know, once the fuselage halves were, were joined together, I just felt like going full metal jacket was the best, uh, the best thing to do. So that, uh, you know, that was, that was a new exercise for me, learning to do a little bit of brass tubing soldering and things like that, uh, but I, you know, I feel like it was worth it. Moving a little farther back, uh, I've used uh, resin seats from Pavla uh, in the cockpit. They were the nicest ones that I found. They had nicely molded seat belts and uh, the cushions that, as I understand it, were put on the backs of the, or, or the life rafts, rather, that were used as cushions for the backs of the seats in the Doolittle aircraft. Uh, there are other parts. Uh, I also used the uh, the bombardier's seat up here in the nose, um, and there were other parts as well. In fact, you can get an entire the, the, the kit uh, from Pavla comes with an entire chin piece, but it was even more horribly warped than the one from the box. So I chose to use the uh, the uh, the kit part for this uh, chin piece right here. And it was one of the worst parts of, of the whole project because it just fit horribly. And that's something that other people have found as well. Uh, anyway, moving on uh, aft and underneath, which you can't see, uh, I've also used the uh, Pavla crew access doors and ladders, which are really pretty nicely molded. Far from perfect. Um, I, I, you know, I would have rather seen something with the crispness and quality of, of uh, you know, something like something from Def Models, for example. Uh, but they were definitely better than the kit uh, crew access doors, which had horrible uh, ejector pin marks uh, right in the middle of them. I also, speaking of Def Models, used their very lovely wheel set for this kit, um, which were really good and which I've discussed uh, as well. Uh, the uh, aerials uh, uh, were replaced, the plastic parts were replaced with some 25,000 stainless st steel tubing, not only for strength, but also because it allowed me to just run the uh, easy line that I used for the aerial down into the tube, which I thought looked pretty cool. I doubt that that's accurate. Um, I know that that aerial wire has to be grounded somehow and has to get down into the fuselage. Um, but I don't actually know how it was done. Um, one of my buddies asked me about putting some insulators on there, and I, and I probably should have, but I didn't have good photographic references of, of how that aerial was actually supposed to be configured. One thing I did note is that in a couple of illustrations that I saw, it shows aerial wires not only uh, here, but going from the, from the fuselage here back to the... Uh, back to the rudder. So basically from right here back to right here and then even another one from here down to about right here. But I couldn't see anything in any photographs to support the presence of those wires and in particular uh, in photographs of the Doolittle aircraft on board the Hornet you can't see anything but this one right here. So that's that's the only one that I included. 
I did do a little bit of detail work in the uh, engine compartment. Uh, just a few additional uh, wires and hoses um, made from, uh, from lead wire. The one thing Accurate Miniatures did do a fairly nice job of, you know, all things considered, um, is uh, the ignition ring and the ignition wires uh, being a molded piece of plastic. They, they weren't perfect, but they weren't so bad that I felt compelled to rewire two engines that, uh, you know, really wouldn't be all that visible uh, to replace them. So I think that was a, 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 you know, that was just kind of a strategic decision on my part. Um, again, going a little further back, um, I replaced the, uh, the fuel dump vents. Uh, there's two of them, a large one and a small one with brass and stainless steel tubing. Um, you can't see underneath and I'm, and I'm not going to pick it up because you could see it in the photographs hopefully, but I also did some detail uh, wiring on the landing gear, the main gear. They have a couple of hydraulic lines that run straight down each side of the main gear strut as well as uh, a brake line coming out of the, the, uh, the center of the, of the uh, axle that kind of wraps around the assembly down there. I did that as well. Um, one thing that some people may ask about is the props. Uh, first of all, why are they so black and why don't they have any uh, yellow tips? And this is worth explaining. Um, when the aircraft arrived in San Diego, just prior to being uh, lifted aboard the Hornet, they got basically a full-on engine tune-up and a few last-minute uh, tweaks that uh, Doolittle wanted. And one of the things that he requested was that all the aircraft get brand new props. So if they look like brand new black props, that's because that's exactly what they are. Um, they, you know, were basically run up in ground tests, but saw zero flight time before they actually lifted off the deck of the Hornet. So brand new props. And you can see from reference photographs that they did not have the yellow tips. So I feel like I've reproduced that faithfully. Uh, moving on back, the next thing is I replaced the kit gun barrels with the two-piece brass barrels from Master that are just beautiful. They have a, the actual barrel and then the uh, cooling jacket that slips over them, and they really are worth doing. I, I think they just add such a nice level of, of realism to pretty much any project. Um, and that's really, uh, I think that's... That's about it. All of the markings uh, were um, masked and painted using masks from Montex, which I thought actually worked pretty well. Um, I was pretty pleased with the material that they use and, and just the overall design of it. I, I was a little annoyed at first at the way that they had, uh, uh, you know, set it up because of the, of the order that you end up spraying the red, white, and the blue, but it all ended up working out fine. The only decal on this entire project is right here, and that's the data plate underneath the cockpit. And if you are super sharp-eyed, you will notice that it is not a B-25 data plate, but it is actually a P-51 data plate uh, from uh, the Revell 148 Mustang kit. Uh, I did cut off the part that says P-51. Uh, reason being is because uh, the decals that came with the kit, um, you know, I assume because they're 10 or 15 years old, were just completely useless. I tried to get one of the data plate decals off, and I literally let the, the decal sit in decal water for 20 minutes, and it never budged. I mean, would not come off the paper. So, you know, I did what I had to do, and uh, that's, that. you know, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Now, uh, as far as paint you guys have seen, um, you know, ad nauseum if you've watched the, uh, the videos. If not, the basic summary is this. Uh, pretty much all of the colors are Tamiya. The uh, olive drab is Tamiya's uh, olive drab that's been uh, mixed with varying amounts of white. Uh, the basic overall color is about 40% white on top and about 20% white on the sides and then underneath where it wouldn't see as much uh, fading from the sun. These aircraft were only about a year old when they went on the Doolittle Raid, maybe a little bit older. 
Uh, for those of you that don't know, the, uh, the Doolittle Raider aircraft were taken from the 17th Bomb Group in uh, Oregon, which uh, starting in uh, early 1941 was flying daily anti-submarine patrols. Uh, and, um, you know, so, you know, ha seeing quite a, a, a busy operational tempo off of an air, you know, off of a runway in the Pacific Northwest. So lots of rain, lots of grime. Uh, in fact, one of the aircraft that ended up going on the raid actually sunk a Japanese submarine um, after, uh, after Pearl Harbor. Um, so, you know, that's kind of kind of a cool thing. And most of the pilots that went on the, well, I guess all the pilots except Doolittle, really, uh, that went on the raid were from the uh, 17th Bomb Group. After they left Oregon, uh, all the aircraft were, were taken to Eglin Air Base in Florida. And that's where they did all of their training for the raid and all of the modifications. Uh, they spent about three weeks there. Uh, and that's where they had, uh, one thing that I forgot to mention was this armor plate right here. What they found uh, is uh, that when the 50 cals were in the low position like this, and they were fired a lot, that they would just, the blast would pop the rivets out of the fuselage right there. And so ground crews started adding this extra aluminum plate right here. And that eventually became a production item. Uh, but that's one thing that I added uh, myself. But at any rate, um, in Florida, the aircraft... Uh, had lots of work done, you know, everything that wasn't necessary was was discarded. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the guns and the turrets were not working very well, so they did a lot of engineering on them to get them operating the way that they should be. They had an additional fuel tank installed uh, to give them uh, the, uh, you know, additional range that they were going to need to get all the way to China. Um, you know, just basically uh, a, a fast and furious three weeks there of getting these planes ready before they uh, hedge hopped all the way from Florida to San Diego uh, just a couple of days before they uh, were due to depart on the Hornet. So it's really a, it's really a pretty fascinating story. Um, and I would encourage you guys uh, to read all about it. Um, and in fact, I'm going to direct you to a book that, uh, that uh, I highly recommend, actually two books that I highly recommend uh, right now. Okay, actually, before I move on to that, I guess, I guess I should give you just a quick rundown of some of the issues with this kit, uh, just very briefly. Um, these, uh, I already mentioned the issue with the fitment of the uh, chin piece. The uh, canopy did not fit all that great, had to do a little bit of work on that, but it wasn't horrible. Uh, the really tough area was with the nacelles. This piece right here, uh, the uh, intakes, is a separate piece that fits into a recess right here on top of the nacelle. And the joint runs around it like this and it was really bad. I spent a lot of time working with that joint and getting it all fared in, uh, you know, and then rescribed and re-riveted. And I'm pretty pleased with the way that it came out, given how difficult it was. I, there also was a pretty bad step joint between the nacelle and the uh, wing root on the underside that took quite a bit of work. But uh, that, you know, that wasn't too bad. Um, it also had really bad gaps right here. This panel line that you can see right here is actually uh, where, it, where the lower portion of the nacelle joins the upper surface of the wing. And the wing root, the, the, the gap was really bad there. I ended up having to fill those gaps with stretched sprue because it was so bad. Another major issue that I had uh, is that the two halves of my fuselage did not uh, line up along the entire length. Once I had it assembled, it was even at either extreme, basically the nose and the tail, but intermediate locations like the front edge of, the, of, of this joint, the, uh, the opening for this window, the panel lines all along here, clear back to the opening for the rear turret, were all misaligned by up to probably a millimeter. <laughs> And that caused me no end of hassle. I, I had to fill in all these panel lines up here on the top, 
rescribe them. I had to fix the opening here for the window. That was probably one of the worst parts about the whole project, and I, and I ended up spending a lot of time on that. One other thing that I ended up doing um, was that I discovered uh, after I already had uh, assembled the tail plane to the fuselage was that it was crooked, uh, which is, uh, you know, was, was kind of a mystery at first because the joint and everything, you know, the assembly was straightforward and the joint all the way around it uh, looked good, but it had about a five millimeter tilt to it. Um, in other words, it was about five millimeters higher on this side than it was on this side. And it was just too much, I couldn't take it. So I ended up sawing the tail off, putting a shim underneath the left side right here that was about a millimeter thick and, and reassembling everything to correct that tilt. And I'm really glad that I went to the effort of doing that. When I got it off of there and could, and could look again at the profile of the fuselage right here, it was pretty obvious that the reason was that because the two fuselage halves just weren't uh, weren't weren't the same. Um, so why that was uh, is anybody's guess. How it slipped through quality control is anybody's guess. Uh, I think, uh, and this is where I will talk for a minute about about the kit overall. I think, uh, well, let me just say, if you've watched any of of this series you know what I think of this kit. Uh, I think, you know, by any objective measure, when you compare it to something modern from somebody like Tamiya, that this is in fact a terrible kit. <laughs> it's got a lot of lovely surface detail and the shape of the, of the thing is perfect for a B25, but it has so many engineering fit and molding issues that I just can't objectively say anything other than that it is, it's, it's terrible. Um, can it be built into a, into a, a good, a good uh, result? Yeah, obviously. There's no such thing as an, un, as an unbuildable kit. But um, how bad it is, uh, and let, let, me, let, me, let me preface this by saying that uh, as I was mentioning at the beginning of, of this video, this thing is really polarizing. I found out as soon as I went online and stated my thoughts about the kit, just how polarizing it is because I immediately had people say, you know, you're an idiot, you don't have basic modeling skills, this is a wonderful kit, the guy who started Accurate Miniatures was an amazing scratch builder and he did all this engineering and you know blah blah blah. But the facts speak for themselves. You can watch all 10 hours of video that I've produced on this thing and see exactly what all of the issues are. But I think that part of what determines how much trouble you have with this kit is uh, in what vintage of it you get. They ran the production on this thing, as I understand it, for about seven years. And it's very possible that over time they fixed some tooling issues. And here's one reason that I, that I say that. I, I mentioned this in one of the video segments. This is a fuselage section, a fuselage that uh, I got from a buddy of mine. He actually <laughs> was going to build this kit and then uh, decided not to based on everything he had seen in my videos. And so as a joke one day, he cut the entire uh, uh, thing off the sprues and used it as packing material uh, in a box of paint that he sent me. Um, anyway, one thing that I note, decided to do was just to glue these two fuselage halves together and see, hey, do they mismatch as badly as mine did? And in fact, they don't. There's practically no mismatch on this fuselage, which you can see. And the, uh, the profile, when you look at it you know, from the end, the profile doesn't have the same weirdness that, that, that mine did right here along the tail. So it's possible that some of that stuff uh, was addressed. They both came off the same sprue. Both fuselage halves do, so who knows? But obviously not everything was fixed. And here's a, a good example of that. If you look here uh, inside, the, uh, inside the bomb bay, okay, you can see that up there at the top of the bomb bay is a rail, and that's where the uh, vertical ribs on the bomb racks are supposed to recess into when you assemble it. And that all seems pretty straightforward, right? Well, huh, when you flip the thing over, 
and look at the same portion of the fuselage on the other side, uh, see anything missing? Yeah, the notch is in that uh, top rail, <laughs> which basically means that the bomb rack on the right side of the fuselage will not fit flush unless you do something about that. So anyway, that is just uh, you know one example of, of the kind of issues that, that I ran into and that other people run into with, the, with this kit. Um, but again, it's, it's certainly buildable. It just depends on how hard you're willing to work at it. Okay, enough of all that. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the discussion of the actual model is done. <laughs> Um, and now I want to talk about something that I've honestly been waiting for a long time to talk about. And that's uh, about Doolittle himself. If, if you're not familiar with Doolittle's story beyond the Pearl Harbor, uh, not Pearl Harbor, <laughs> uh, beyond the Tokyo Raid, I strongly encourage you to spend some time and learn about this guy. Um, he is a true American hero in my estimation. Um, you know, you've probably seen the movie Pearl Harbor may have even seen 30 seconds over Tokyo uh, and so you know the basic story of that and uh, in fact uh, probably are aware that Doolittle was uh, awarded the Medal of Honor for his role in leading the Tokyo Raid. Um, on that score what you may not know is that uh, of all of the people to receive the Medal of Honor Doolittle is probably the only one who ever told his commanding general that he didn't want it. <laughs> um, he, what happened was that uh, when Doolittle finally made his way back to the United States, uh, which involved a month-long journey that took him the rest of the way around the world from China, and he ended up back in Washington, D.C., uh, he and Hap Arnold were riding in the car uh, to the White House so that uh, President Roosevelt could pin the Medal of Honor on Doolittle's chest and Hap Arnold told him that that's what was about to happen, and Doolittle was shocked and without thinking, which was kind of a pattern with him. He tended to uh, to uh, kind of wear his emotions on his sleeve and, and not uh, always uh, filter his thoughts. <laughs> he, uh, he told Hap Arnold that uh, he didn't feel like he deserved the Medal of Honor because the guys that flew the mission with him were the real heroes. And... Uh, that should tell you everything you need to know about what kind of guy Jimmy Doolittle was. Uh, Hap Arnold was not happy and basically said, you're going to shut your mouth and you're going to accept the medal with good grace and we're going to pretend this conversation never happened. Um, so, you know, I think that's uh, that says a lot about Doolittle's character. But what a lot of people don't know, I certainly did not know until I read Doolittle's uh, autobiography, which... You know, this thing was is quite a chunk of reading. It's 500 pages, but definitely uh, time well spent. And since I was taking so long to build the model, you know, it, it, it didn't really matter. Um, but if you read that, you learn a lot about uh, what Doolittle's contribution to American aviation was beyond uh, his wartime heroics. Um, he uh, actually entered the Army uh, Air Service around 1920. He missed World War I, uh, even though he was already in the Army. He was just too young. And one of his first exploits was to lead a train of pack mules into Mexico to retrieve a, I believe it was a Curtis Jenny, an old biplane that was, uh, had been uh, crash-landed there by another Army pilot, um, and to bring it back. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, you know, can you just imagine the adventure, uh, two weeks into Mexico with a train of pack mules to go retrieve an airplane. I mean, what, you know, um, that, that could be a movie uh, unto itself. Um, but over the next uh, 20 years, Doolittle spent a tremendous amount of time racing airplanes, uh, crashing airplanes. He probably crashed more than crashed more airplanes than anybody in the, uh, you know, in, in that period of time. I, but, but, you know, that was just his deal. In fact, he would, he would rack up close to 20,000 hours of flying time but, but by the time he uh, hung up his wings in the, uh, in the 50s. 
Um, but his contributions to American aviation were, were diverse. Um, not only did he win a lot of races and set a lot of speed records, but he pursued and was awarded a PhD in aeronautical engineering from MIT. And uh, a big part of what he did to earn that was his research and development work on avionics. Um, Doolittle was, was the first guy to fly blind using instruments only. Um, and that took a tremendous amount of courage because at that time, pilots were being killed daily because of the difficulty of navigating in uh, fog and, and other low visibility conditions. Uh, after he did um, a lot of that work, he, uh, he moved, uh, he, he, he went to a, basically a reserve officer position that allowed him to take on civilian work and he worked for Shell Oil. And uh, Doolittle, probably more than any other single person, is responsible for the fact that all American aircraft in World War II uh, used high-octane fuel. Uh, he was vice president of sales, and he basically saw not only a revenue opportunity for Shell in high-octane fuel, which no one was really producing at that time, but he also saw a military need for it based on his own research work um, because he knew that uh, the horsepower gains uh, from using high octane fuel, 100 octane fuel basically, uh, were tremendous. And he also saw the benefit of standardizing the fuel requirement across all uh, American military aviation. So he really was a forward looking guy and uh, made a lot of tremendous contributions in that way. His uh, wartime contributions didn't end with Pearl Harbor. In fact, he went on to command the 8th Air Force in Europe. And in fact, uh, this is um, one of the cool things I think uh, um, that also says a lot about Doolittle's character. He was orbiting the beaches of Normandy in his own personal P-38 as an observer uh, on D-Day. Uh, which, I mean, just think about the career that that spans. To go from you know, pack mule train into Mexico to fetch a Curtis Jenny to watching D-Day unfold underneath you um, as it was happening. And in fact, he would also end up being part of the uh, uh, treaty signing ceremony. Um, I forget what the name of the ship was, but in the Pacific when the Japanese surrendered because his bomb group got moved to the Pacific right before the war ended there. So. Um, I mean, just, you know, the amount of history that this guy participated in and witnessed is amazing. So, just very cool stuff. One more Doolittle story um, that I think is really cool. Uh, he always had a little bit of problem with Eisenhower. Uh, Eisenhower didn't like him at first, but they, you know, eventually got to be uh, pretty close. But one thing that Eisenhower could never get Doolittle to do was to stop trying to fly. Um, Doolittle was in uh, the first bomber over Rome, just like he was over Tokyo. Uh, he tried to be in the first bomber over Berlin, but that got kanked by, by Eisenhower, who wisely at that time understood that Doolittle had better things to, to be doing. But he still tried to maintain his flying hours, and when he heard about problems that pilots were having with aircraft under his command, he liked to go investigate himself. And one thing that was happening uh, was that a lot of P-38 pilots were ex experiencing uh, engine flameouts uh, on takeoff. You know, basically, as soon as they went wheels up, they were having engine fires, which obviously could be a pretty bad thing. Now, Doolittle studied the problem, decided he knew what the cause was, um, went out to, you know, whatever the nearest airfield was to uh, where his uh, headquarters was located, uh, checked out a P-38, did exactly the things that he thought needed to happen on takeoff to make the engine catch fire, <laughs> which it did, um, and then, you know, promptly turned the airplane around, landed it, and said to the uh, officers who were observing, okay, there you go. If you just don't do this, this, and this, the engines won't catch on fire. So, <laughs> you know... And he just, you know, he had a history of, of doing that sort of thing, which just, you know, really appeals to me. I think it's very cool. Now, speaking of books about Doolittle, 
I would be very remiss if I did not also mention this book, which is also very cool. This is written by an author named Ted Briscoe, and if you're really sharp-eyed and you're looking in the instruction sheet for the Accurate Miniatures kit, you will notice Ted Briscoe's name included in the credits where Accurate Miniatures thanked him for his uh, assistance and development of this kit. And that is because Ted was a member of the Doolittle Raiders Association for probably uh, 30 years and knew Doolittle personally, as well as, uh, you know, most of the other guys. And he uh, found my videos just randomly and we started corresponding. And he sent me this book as well as some other really cool stuff which I thought was just amazing. And he, you know, uh, it was cool enough that, that, he, that he did that, but he included uh, a really nice letter with all of that. And um, I, uh, I, want to, I want to read uh, just a little bit of, uh, of this letter to you because it really it was kind of a <clears throat> really was kind of a kind of a cool thing. Um, you guys know that I've you know been recovering from being uh, from from being paralyzed from the neck down uh, seven or so years ago, and that I've you know that I just continue to fight my way through that. And Ted knows about my situation, and uh, this is from one of the paragraphs in his letter. You may know that the Doolittle Tokyo Raiders have a group motto, which is Toujours au danger, or ever into peril. And I... <laughs> and I believe that this motto suits your situation quite well. Since your accident... <clears throat> Oh, this may be harder than I thought. <laughs> Since your accident, you have persevered to a point that many would not believe could be done. And in a similar situation, many would probably just give up. And this is the attitude of the Tokyo Raiders. They knew that the odds were against them when the Japanese spotted them outside their intended fuel safe limit. But they just got in their B-25s and took off. So much for the odds being against them. And you have done the same. Jimmy Doolittle would insist that I send you the following items. <laughs> and uh, he goes on to, uh, to list uh, a whole, uh, <laughs> the contents of the box of, of stuff that, uh, that he sent me. Um, so uh, thank you, Ted. Thank you um, for... Uh, Sorry guys, it's a uh, it's a plastic model project, right? It's uh, it's not supposed to uh, make us quite that emotional, but uh, I've invested a lot of myself in this project over the last uh, eleven months, and uh, so that kind of just sort of uh, I guess represents the uh, I don't know just uh, exactly, um, you know, how much that's true. Um, I don't really know, know what else to say about it. Uh, but anyway, I can see that the little red light is uh, on my uh, video camera, which means the battery is about to die. And that's probably a good thing before I do any more snuffling and blubbering about all of this stuff. At any rate, uh, if you've watched any or all of this project unfold, I really, really appreciate it. Um, it's been kind of a long journey. When I started it, I thought it was going to be kind of a simple project where I was going to <laughs> show how I did some weathering. <laughs> and obviously, it took on a life of its own. But, you know, sometimes the best things in life uh, do that. So, at any rate, thank you if you've kept up with this. Um, and, uh, you know, as always, for you guys that uh, put up with my nonsense and watch my videos, much love. Take care.